All right, well, this morning we're going to um, look at um, three verses in uh, 1 John chapter 2 that where John is addressing the various categories of spiritual maturity in the church. And, um, you know, just, just to remind us in, from this passage that they do exist and what the characteristics are of each, perhaps to get a bit of a uh, reading on where we are spiritually and what it is, you know, that the Lord wants us, uh, the direction He wants us to go, the kind of growth that He wants to see in us. Uh, I'd like to read the verse, these verses in context, so I'll begin in verse 1 of 1 John chapter 2. This is what um, John writes. My, my little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation, he is the satisfaction for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for those of the whole world. By this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. The one who says, I have come to know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar. And the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, in him the love of God has truly been perfected. By this we know that we are in him. The one who says he abides in him ought himself to walk or to live in the same manner as he walked. Beloved, I am not writing a new commandment to you, but an old commandment which you have had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you have heard. On the other hand, I am writing a new commandment to you, which is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. The one who says he is in the light and yet hates his brother is in the darkness until now. The one who loves his brother abides in the light and there is no cause for stumbling in him. But the one who hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. I am writing to you, little children, because your sins have been forgiven you for his name's sake. I am writing to you, fathers, because you know him who has been from the beginning. I am writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. I have written to you, children, because you know the Father. I have written to you, fathers, because you know him who has been from the beginning. I have written to you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of God abides in you, and you have overcome the evil one. May the Lord bless his uh, word to our hearing this morning. It just kind of strikes, strikes us, I think, that often through the letter, uh, John is addressing what he says, my little children, and there are certainly different senses in which the word children is used here, but there were children present in this congregation. <clears throat> and because of it, they were liable to fall into certain errors. He is addressing a particular error which we'll actually look at uh, next Lord's Day, which was called Gnosticism, which if it were embraced, would actually destroy them. And so he's urging them to grow up. And I think, again, the fact that he recognizes there's different levels of maturity within the congregation uh, certainly implies that there is growth and that we ought to be seeking to grow, especially that we wouldn't be uh, liable to be victimized by these false ideas, but rather be strong in the Lord and be able to refute the lies of the devil and to do battle with him and actually to overcome him, not just in the ideas of false doctrine, but also in the uh, area of overcoming our sins and putting on the Lord Jesus. Now, just to back up a little bit, we, we have been looking or considering that even though the gospel is that we are saved by grace through faith alone, through the works of our Lord Jesus Christ, through trusting in him, we are not saved by a faith that, that is alone, but by a faith that produces works, a faith that moves us to obedience. We are not saved by obeying the Lord, but we're not saved without obeying the Lord. You see, that is the evidence that we belong to Him. If we are justified, there will be works. If we are really trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ, there will be, of course, the indications that there is spiritual life present in us. We know from our own experience that if something is alive, it will, among other things, 
move, okay? Things that are dead don't move, but things that are alive do move. If we are spiritually alive, we will also move, okay? Our hearts will move us towards Jesus to become more like him. James really summarizes this in James 2.26 where he writes this, For just as the body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. There's no spiritual movement, which is the works, the obedience. There is no spiritual life. Now, we've also been considering that as we grow in our obedience, which will be there if we belong to Jesus, and as we move closer to him, that the Lord will give to us several blessings. We will have a greater assurance that we belong to him because we will see ourselves becoming more like him. I think that was clear from the passage that I just read. The one who says he has come to know him will keep the commandments. The one who has come to know him will love his brother. Uh, we'll see ourselves becoming more like Jesus. That will assure us that we belong to him and that we're not just saying that we believe in Jesus, but we really do believe in him. We'll have a closer fellowship with God. You know, Jesus loved his father with all his heart, and that's what moved him to walk closely with him. As we know, his food and his drink was to do the will of his father. The more we grow in our love for the Lord Jesus, the more we live like Jesus, the closer we will also be to him as well. The closer fellowship we will have with God. We've seen that we'll experience greater spiritual power because we won't be grieving the Spirit of God in, in our lives by our resisting Him and doing things that are offensive to Him. But by yielding to Him, His influence in our hearts will become even greater and we will become even stronger. And let me just say that that is really what spiritual maturity is all about, becoming strong in the Spirit, being filled with the Spirit. The more we have of the Spirit, the more we are going to be like Jesus. And not only will we not be afraid uh, of the day of judgment, you know, if you don't know whether you belong to Jesus, the day of judgment is a rather formidable thing that's looming in front of us. If we're mature in the Lord and filled with the Spirit, we'll actually be able to look forward to the day of judgment, not only because we know that on that day we'll stand in Jesus, but also because we know on that day we'll, we will receive a greater reward. There are rewards for obeying the Lord. But now we also have noticed in our study that obedience, the fact that we are to obey, presupposes that there is a standard of obedience, something we are to obey, and that standard is God's law, the same standard that our Lord Jesus Christ lived by. Now Solomon reminded us last week that if we are to grow in our obedience, and so our blessedness in all these various ways, we need to trust that law. We need to trust that what the Lord says in the law is the right way to go. It is the good thing to do and not what we think is a good thing to do. As Solomon reminded us, don't trust in your own wisdom, but rather trust in the Lord with all your heart. Now, he told us that if we trust God's guidance, he will make our path straight. He will show us how we are to live so that we might gain these blessings. Now, he also said something else that was a little bit confusing at first, and that is that if we will trust the Lord and not lean on our understanding and walk in his ways, that he will also bring healing to our bodies and refreshment to our bones. Now, what that meant was is that the Lord loves us so much that he will do what is necessary to keep us on his path. He will discipline us. Discipline, as you know, is something that comes in various forms, as we saw last week. But it's applied to us so that we will go the right way. Just as we love our children and we discipline them when we see them doing things that we know are, uh, could potentially hurt them, such as uh, if we see our children who don't know how to swim, playing close to the edge of a pool, we're going to remove them or, or move them back away from that and we're going to make sure they don't get too close to it. Or when we see them reaching out to touch the, the fire that's on the stove, we're going to pull their hand back and we're going to correct them so they don't keep going that direction. Or when we see them doing things that could potentially hurt other people as well, 
when they're rude or they're inconsiderate or when they say things that, that may be offensive, when they do things that dishonor the Lord, we will discipline them in the same way the Lord disciplines us so that we will keep going the right way. And the reason he does it is because he loves us. And that's why we do it for our children. At least that's the reason why we should be doing it for our children and not disciplining them in anger. God does not discipline us in anger. He does it out of love to correct us. The author to the Hebrews writes this in Hebrews 12, verses 6 and 7, which is what we saw last week. For those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines, and he scourges every son whom he receives. We don't often think of scourging as being something that's loving, but the Lord does so for us because he loves us. It is for discipline that you endure. God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? Every father who cares about his son disciplines his son because he loves him and wants him to go the right way. The author to the Hebrews goes on to say that if we don't experience the discipline of the Lord, that means we don't even belong to him because if we did, out of his love, he would correct us. And there's always plenty to be corrected uh, in our lives. Now, discipline is not always corrective, but it is always instructional. The Lord teaches us because he loves us and because he wants us to grow. Now, there is a sense in which we cannot enter the kingdom of heaven unless we become as children and implicitly trust in the Lord for all things. But we need to remember or be reminded from what John tells us here this morning, the Father does not want us to remain children. He wants us to grow up. He wants us to become more like Jesus, more like his son, so that we might experience more of his blessing and so that we might be more useful to him. So this morning I want us to consider two things from our text. That there is such a thing as spiritual growth. There isn't just one level of Christianity. There is growth possible. And secondly, that the Lord in fact does want us to grow up. Now first of all, there is such a thing as spiritual growth. John tells us in our text that there's three stages of growth, three levels of maturity, each with its own particular virtues, characteristics, and he calls them children, young men, and fathers. Now, when John wrote this, um, we shouldn't assume that he was m meaning by this to address only the, you know, the, the male uh, constituents of the congregation. I think we need to understand he was addressing women, children, he was addressing the whole congregation, but using words in the same way that we would use the term mankind, you know, to refer to all human beings. What he's saying is that all of us need to grow. All of us need to move from children into young adults. We need to grow from young adults to older adults or more, you know, wiser adults, you see. Now, first, John tells us what is true of each of these levels of spiritual life. And as I've said, as we go through these, perhaps we can identify about where we are and see what it is we need to do, uh, where we need to move, uh, what it is we need to be striving after in our growth in the Lord. Now, first of all, he tells us what's true of spiritual children. He says in verse 12, I am writing to you, little children, because your sins have been forgiven you for his name's sake. And he says in verse 13, I have written to you children because you know the Father. Now children are new converts in the Lord, those who have recently trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ. And actually, as, as we think about it, could be those who trusted him a long time ago who haven't actually grown. But this is what we were when we first came to the Lord. This is what we would call the novice stage, when we still need to be taught what we call the fundamentals of the faith. We're still learning, as it were, how things work in the kingdom of heaven. When we still need the milk of the word, as we read in Hebrews chapter 5. I mean, for babes, they need milk. Uh, Peter tells us that we need to be nurtured on that pure milk of the word, but for those who have been in the church for a long time and should have grown past that stage, you know, they shouldn't be needing just milk. They should be reaching the point where they would eat solid food. Now, sadly, as I was thinking about this, and from my own experience, most of the churches, most of what churches have to give today amounts to nothing more 
than milk. And the problem with that is the members remain, if they drink only milk, they remain perpetual novices. They remain perpetual babes in Christ. Now, it's good to be a babe when you're a babe, but we need to move beyond that. Now, again, at this stage, there are certain things John tells us that we know. We know that most blessed thing that, that we need to know and that we seek to know, and that is that our sins have been forgiven. When we first heard about God's law and we understood what the law meant and that we had broken it, God used that to get us to start looking for a way to escape the consequences of that sin. And that's one of the reasons why we came to the Lord Jesus in the first place. And when we trusted Him, relied on Him alone for our salvation, looked to Him as our Savior and our only hope of heaven, we knew that our sins were forgiven. We knew that He had taken away our guilt and our condemnation that would have destroyed us forever. And we knew we had eternal life and that we would be with Him forever in heaven. That's a great blessing that every believer knows when he first comes to the Lord Jesus Christ. But John tells us that wasn't all that we knew. We also knew that we had entered into a new relationship with God that we didn't have before. Now God was our Father. We were His children. We were adopted into His family. Paul writes in Romans 8, verses 15 through 17, For you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received a spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father. Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, heirs also, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, so that we may also be glorified with him. Uh, we're not going to deal with that if, but I do want you to notice that it is there. If we are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, one of the ways we can know is the fact that by living as Jesus and being hated by the world, we suffer with him. But the point I want to make here is simply this, that if we're trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ, we have the spirit of adoption in our hearts that gives us the confidence to call God our Father and to know that He is our Father. When we came to Jesus as babes, we knew that we had the blessing God promised us in the new covenant, which is what the author to the Hebrews tells us about in Hebrews 8.11. And they shall not teach everyone his fellow citizen and everyone his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all will know me from the least to the greatest of them. That wasn't true of the Old Covenant. Not everybody knew God, but everybody in the New Covenant knows God as Father. They are members of His family. Now, one thing we didn't know at this particular level of growth was how protective the Lord was being of us. And the reason why He was being protective of us, again, we talked about the Lord's love for us and discipline and so forth. He was also protecting us. It was because as babes, we needed protection. We knew so very little. We were so inexperienced in spiritual warfare. The Lord was shielding us from the enemy's attacks until we had the chance to grow. Now, you know, as parents, we protect our children when they're young from the cares and the concerns of the world. We don't want them to be burdened by those things, right? They don't need to know about those things until they reach the age when they're old enough to handle it. Well, the Lord does the same thing with us, which is why when we were new believers, everything seemed, if you can recall that, that time, so easy, so wonderful. There was kind of a closeness with the Lord that we didn't have to struggle to, to obtain. He seemed to hear and answer all of our prayers. It, it just seemed like there was a, a close relationship when we were babes. But as we got older, things became a bit more difficult because of the lessons the Lord had to teach us. They would put us in more difficult situations. You know, the more you grow, the stronger you become, the more difficult the situation has to become to get you to move forward. But that's exactly what the Lord did. He didn't allow us to remain babes. He helped us to grow. And as we grow, as we were growing, He was bringing Again, things into our lives to help us grow even more. Now, that brings us to the second stage of growth, which we might call adulthood or young adulthood. John writes in verse 13, 
I am writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. And in verse 14, I have written to you, young men, because you are strong and the word of God abides in you and you have overcome the evil one. Now again, this is when we have grown to the point where the Lord allows us to experience something of the spiritual warfare that was going on all around us and going on within us, but we were largely unaware of because of our ignorance and because we were being protected and shielded by God. At this point, we've learned more of his word. We have a better understanding of right and wrong. Remember what the author to the Hebrews said, those who are mature have their senses discerned between good and evil. Now we have a better idea of what the differences are and what is good and what is evil. And we've been able to apply that knowledge to our lives to become a little bit more like Jesus. And because of that, we're also stronger spiritually. We've learned to yield to the Spirit of God, to avoid the things that quench Him, that grieve Him, that hinder His work. We become familiar with the armor that God has given to us in order to fight the enemy, and we've gained some skill at using it so that now when the devil comes against us and we know the Lord allows him to do it, you know, the Lord is absolutely in control of Satan and of all the demons. They're not out there doing what they want to do, and God just has to react to what they're doing. If they come against us, it's because God has allowed that for a particular purpose, and the purpose is that we might grow, that we might become stronger. But now at this stage, we're ready for that. You know, we've, we've listened to the Word of God. We know the enemy is out there. We know he's going to come against us. And by the way, he's not just out there, the enemy, I should say. We have an enemy that's in us as well. It's not the devil, thankfully, but it is the flesh, and it's very much like him. And it can also create difficulties for us. But we're ready for these things. We're aware of what the Bible says. For instance, 1 Peter 5, 8, where Peter says, Be of sober spirit, be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Now, when Peter wrote that, was he talking about them only? They're the only ones that had to worry about Satan. We don't have to worry about Satan. No, he's still present, still creating mischief. We still need to be on the lookout for him, but now we are because we know. We've grown up. We can see. We're mature. We know that there is a battle to be fought, and we're ready to fight that battle. Now, reaching this stage also means we become more useful to God. We've overcome some of our doubts and our fears. We know where we stand with Him. We know that our future is secure. And by the way, if we don't know our future is secure, we really can't do anything for the Lord. We're crippled. We need to know we belong to Him. We need to know we're His people before we're going to risk ourselves to do the things that He actually calls us to do. At this stage, we've set our lives aside and picked up our crosses and followed after the Lord. We are more set on doing what the Lord calls us to do, to advance His kingdom, to serve our brothers and sisters in the Lord, and to share the gospel with others. This is the stage we might call young adulthood. But there is still a higher level of maturity, and John writes about it in verses 13 and 14. He says in verse 13, I am writing to you fathers because you know him who has been from the beginning. In verse 14, I have written to you fathers because you know him who has been from the beginning. Now again, that's the main difference is a greater knowledge of God. Okay? Now John, in talking about fathers here, is not talking about those who have been Christians the longest because we all grow at differing rates, don't we? We do that in other ways as well. In this world, we all mature at differing rates. What he's talking about here are those who have walked with the Lord long enough to have gained wisdom, the wisdom that our Lord sets out to teach us. John says that they know the Father. They know him more intimately than the children who call him daddy, as it were, more than the young adults who know him as, again, their father, but they have a greater intimacy than that. They don't just know about him. I think one of the things that um, we often fall into, which isn't altogether wrong unless we stop there, is learning about God, you know, knowing about God, but never really knowing God. See, fathers know him. 
They know what he's like. They know what pleases him. They know what he loves. And they have reached a point in their lives that the thing that is most important to them is that they're willing to do whatever they have to do to know him even more intimately and to honor him more intensely. Now, I think Paul is an example of one who reached this level, and it seems like he reached it relatively quickly. He knew the Lord very well, but he never felt like he knew him well enough. And so he, can, he pressed on, willing to give up whatever he had to so that he might grow closer to him. I mean, listen to his testimony in Philippians 3, verses 7 through 15. Let's all of us measure our lives by what he says here. He says, but whatever things were gained to me, that is in the world and his own pursuits in the world apart from Jesus, whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all these things and count them, but rubbish, but dung, so that I may gain Christ and may be found in him. Not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings be conformed to his death in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained it or have already become perfect, but I press on so that I may lay hold of that for which also I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let us, therefore, as many as are perfect, in this case, the word means mature, have this attitude. And if in anything you have a different attitude, God will reveal that also to you. Paul says what he just expressed here is the attitude that the Lord wants each of us to have, okay, to press on towards this kind of maturity. Now, we're not really told in the Bible how many people actually achieve this maturity in life, and I think we know by experience that very few do. Some never move beyond infancy. Others beyond young adulthood. Thankfully, we're all going to reach this stage one day, though, and that is when we are with the Lord in heaven. But again, this brings us to the second point, and that is that God wants us to grow up. He wants us to mature. He doesn't want us to stay where we are. He wants us to go as far as we possibly can in this life while we're traveling from this world to the one which is coming. I've already told you about the author to the Hebrews when he was writing to those who were being tempted to fall back into Judaism to save their lives in this world, even though it would cost them their souls. I mean, what was their level of maturity? Well, they weren't fathers, they weren't young adults, they were babes. He says, you become like babes, accustomed only to the milk of the word. You Actually, you need to go back and, and drink from that milk again, but you need to grow up. Now, why did he want them to grow up? It's because he knew that that would preserve them from falling to this temptation. He writes again in, in chapter 5, verses 12 through 14. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you you have need again for someone to teach you the elementary principles, the ABCs of the oracles of God, and you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is not accustomed to the word of righteousness, for he is an infant. But solid food is for the mature who, because of practice, have their senses trained to discern good and evil. You see, here's one way we can gauge where we're at with regard to the Lord. Are we still in danger of of falling away? Are we still being tempted by the world and wanting to... I mean, we're all tempted at some level, but are we at the point where we're going to abandon Jesus to go back into the world? We're still then at the infant stage if we're believers at all. If anyone abandons the Lord, he doesn't belong to the Lord. He never did belong to the Lord. Spiritual growth will preserve us. It will secure us. 
It will help us to see through the lies of the enemy. I mean, who was it that was tempting the, the audience that the author to the Hebrews was writing to to abandon Christianity for Judaism? It was the devil. Who is it that is promoting all the different philosophies in this world that are giving people an excuse not to believe what the Bible teaches? It's, it's the devil. Spiritual growth will preserve us from this. It will help us see through the lies of the devil and appreciate the relationship we have with the Lord so that we'll push forward in that relationship. So in closing, let me just give a little bit of an answer to the question of how. Okay, how do we grow? How do we grow up in the Lord? How do we become more mature? Well, if we are in fact spiritually alive, if we've trusted the Lord Jesus as our Savior, if we've submitted to Him as our Lord in everything, we will experience growth. You know, every living thing not only moves, every living thing grows, and the Lord will make sure that we grow. But to achieve the kind of maturity that we see in the Apostle Paul requires a couple of things, really. It requires, of course, the Lord's sovereign call on our lives to make us that kind of a person, to do that kind of work. And we're not all necessarily called to do what Paul did, but we are all called to have the kind of love and commitment that he had to the Lord in the things that he has called us to do. But that requires a great deal of effort on our part. It's cooperative. There's our part that we have to do in our growth in grace and our sanctification, and there's the part the Lord will do. Now, the Lord is going to help us grow through his gracious correction, through his discipline, as we've already seen. As our loving Heavenly Father, he's going to make sure we stay on the right path and we learn lessons as we get off and he brings us back on. The Lord is also going to send trials, allow us to experience something of the warfare. Uh, he's going to bring that into our lives in order to help us grow, to seek him, right? But again, there are things we can do that will also promote this growth. We can pray and ask for the Lord's help. By the way, if you're going to pray and ask for that, you better be ready for the answer to that prayer because it's going to come. But it's going to come anyway, so you might as well pray, right? Because if you don't pray, the Lord's going to bring something to make you pray. So don't worry about that. Pray and ask for the Lord for his help. Study the word of God. Trust in him. Apply his word as we saw in Proverbs 3. Five and six. Join together with the saints in worshiping the Lord. These things that we're doing here this morning are meant to build us up in Christ and to make us more like Jesus. Participate in the worship in the Lord's Supper. That's a means of grace too, one of the ways the Lord nurtures us. Fellowship with one another in one another's gifts. Christian fellowship, remember, is more than just talking about maybe that thing we enjoyed, that sports event, that movie, and so forth. It's actually using what God has given us to build one another up in the Lord Jesus Christ. So we need to be fellowshipping in one another's gifts. And of course, we can also fast and seek the Lord for more of his grace. But then there's something else we have to do. We need to take the grace, which is the help of the Holy Spirit that God gives to us through all these different ways we get it. But when we get it, we need to use it. Okay? We need to exercise it by fighting against our sins and by putting on the Lord Jesus, seeking to do what the Lord has actually called us to do. Now, that's where we actually take hold of it and we begin to grow. Otherwise, we may feel like we can do something, but we're not really doing anything. We can feel like we can grow, but we're not really growing because growing requires activity. We need to fight against our sin, put that off. We need to put on Jesus, do what the Lord calls us to do. Now, if we only put a little effort into doing this, we're only going to grow a little. One of the things about the Apostle Paul is the love of Christ constrained him to give himself fully. And he was always, you know, he, he talks about it in 1 uh, Corinthians chapter 9 as a race that he's running, a competition that he's involved in, as beating his own body, running this race he put everything he had into it, which is why we see him experiencing what he experienced, at least one of, I think, the main reasons to it. If we only put a little into this, you only get a little back. If you 
you know, as you know, if you're training, uh, doing uh, athletics, you're exercising, you only put a little bit in, you're only going to get a little bit out. But if you give yourself wholly to it, you get more results. If we give ourselves wholly to the Lord, we can, by His grace, become a lot more like Jesus than we are now and, and certainly much more than we could have thought possible. But that is what the Lord wants for us because He loves us. And because he knows this is good for us, this is why he sent Jesus into the world, is so that we might become more like him. Now this evening, as I've already mentioned before, we're going to look at how growing in the Lord will help us benefit more from the ways that he has given us actually to grow. We call this a virtuous circle. The more I use the means of grace, the more I use the ways God has given me to grow, the more I'm going to grow, and the more I grow, the more these means are actually going to help me grow. And that's why we see the experiences we see of God's people in the Word who, you know, the, the Word was much more powerful in their lives. Their prayers were much more powerful than our prayers. Why is that? It's because they were more mature in the Lord. They had more of the Spirit of God working in their lives. They had grown up in the Lord. And that's something we can experience if we will simply set our hearts to seek the Lord for this growth. Well, let's, uh, let's bow for a moment of prayer, shall we? And let's ask the Lord to help us desire this. It starts in the heart. Let's ask for his Holy Spirit to give us a stronger desire to seek him and to grow in him.